So we're going to begin this afternoon's session with a short presentation from Dr. Anan Al-Sheikh Haider. Dr. Haider is a scholar of international law from Syria and a research fellow at the Institute of International Peace and Security at the University of Cologne. Dr. Haider received her diploma in law from the University of Damascus in 2000 and completed her PhD in international human rights law at the University of Reading. She was previously a lecturer at the University of Damascus, as well as at the Syrian Virtual University. She has published and lectured on numerous topics relating to international law, the Syrian conflict, and international criminal law. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Haider to the stage. Uh, thank you, Shini Dokerman, for the great uh, introduction. And uh, it's a real honor for me uh, today to be, he to be here uh, to share with you my uh, work experience. experience. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. As uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Okerman mentioned that I am here also I am a scholar at risk, and um, uh, I was a lecturer at Damascus University, and I'm now a, research, uh, a researcher at uh, Cologne University at Institute uh, for International Peace and Security. In fact, um, uh, I received uh, my fellowship uh, from Shilip, uh, Philip Schwartz Initiative and uh, hosted by the University of Cologne, to which both I am very grateful. Um, I am working now at the Institute for International Peace and Security Law. So what I'm doing there? Uh, in fact, uh, I am working on international criminal justice in the Middle East. As I finished my doctorate in 2010 uh, in October, which was about uh, the enforcement of international criminal justice in the Middle East, uh, and I was uh, intending to publish it, but unfortunately, I got back to Syria uh, uh, at the end of 2010. And as everyone know, uh, know that the Arab Spring started just a few months later, I wasn't able to uh, work on my research anymore. I stayed in, C in Syria for three years, just uh, lecturing, uh, doing lectures and giving lectures at the School of Law. I wasn't allowed to teach international criminal law or talk about human rights during the Syrian uh, conflict. And at that time, I felt that, oh, my career even ended be before I started. Although that, I stayed there. I wanted to stay and in my country. I, was, I didn't want to become a refugee. But then I forced to flee, and I came to Germany. And here again, I thought I stayed one year and a half without being even accepted as a refugee. So I said, ah, my career, there is no possibility that I can get back on track or start working on what I love, which is international criminal law, prosecuting the perpetrators of international crimes and who violates human rights. Later on, just um, I met Dr. Mulal, who is working at the international office, who enlightened me that I can get the scholarship. And he introduced me to my chef, Professor Klaus Griesel, who would love to come here, but he couldn't. And it was, for me, the opportunity which really returned life to me. It's not only my career. I'm working at the institute with the best expert in my subject, who, from the first meeting, uh, tried to discuss with me what, are, what I'm going to do, what is the best to do, and he said, Anan, you should start working on your research, on your doctorate. It was a really interesting topic at that time in 2010 because it was talking about international criminal justice in the Middle East. And after seven years of war in Syria, a lot of crimes committed, crimes against humanity, war crimes. So it's the best to include what is happening and to update it, and it will be a very interesting book, and more important than ever. 
So I really spent nearly more than one year working on it, and now the first draft finished, and he, uh, my chef is reading the first draft with the aim of publish it. And also, the second, uh, the second thing he told me, Anan, you are expert in human, uh, in human rights, and you are coming from Syria, and you even experienced the war in Syria. Why don't join my team? He has a team who started working on the Syrian conflict and documenting the Syrian, uh, the international crimes in, the, in Syria since March 2012. And then he said, "Ha, ah, you are welcome to join us. And he even encouraged me and he said how valuable to join the team because you are from Syria and you are specialized in international criminal law. And I became member directly when I started my work at the Institute. So um, uh, the work on the Syrian conflict will be also published later on, but I couldn't guess when because it will only end when the Syrian conflict ends. And unfortunately, we, could, we couldn't now expect, expect when the Syrian conflict will end. So I felt how much I'm important at the Institute. In Syria, I felt nothing. I even felt I couldn't talk about what I learned, and I was suppressed. My lecture, there was Imma security men in the lecture, listening to what I'm saying in case I say anything against the regime, or even if I talk about human rights or teach them. They also, uh, of course, at the end, because I couldn't stop from working or doing some activities, I forced to flee. Here, my life gets back to me. I speak my mind, I work on what I love, on, on what I learned, I even explored my expertise in this area, I gave talks, I attended seminars on the Syrian conflict, and we tried to explore with other colleagues who are experts in the area what are the options for prosecuting international crimes in Syria. I also joined a team of lawyers who are working in Berlin here, who are trying to seek, uh, to seek justice in German courts uh, under the universal jurisdiction. And I feel here alive. I feel, when I left Syria, to be honest, I felt, oh, how I left my country, why I left my people, I, sh I should die there. But at the end, I felt I could participate in something. I could do something. Maybe I'm better here than that I could work and do something in international criminal law, which could, at the end, in somehow participate to the uh, possibilities for prosecuting the regime or, or the, even the uh, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, I don't know what to talk about also. In what I want to say, in fact, the fellowship the which was given to me, the University of Cologne, both enabled me to be human again, to get back to life, to get back on track, to feel I can continue. When I felt once, no, my life stopped. I, am, I became a refugee and I didn't want to be so. I also become a mother directly when I arrived nearly nine months after arriving to Germany, so mother and a refugee, that means career ended. But how lucky I am. How lucky I am and how much I wish such initiatives to continue. And how much I'm thankful, I'm grateful to all of uh, initiatives. To the universities who opened their doors to host us, to accept different scholars from different backgrounds, even I don't speak at that time any German, but I had the opportunity, and they also opened German courses for me, so also I'm working on the German language in the best uh, courses could be provided. So thank you, and I wish such opportunities to my colleague, to other Syrian, to other Turkish scholars, to other to who really it is at risk. I wish to have the same opportunities because sometimes I feel lucky and at the same time guilty because there are others who wish for the same opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Heider, for your very moving presentation. I think it's, it's very heartening to hear that even from outside of Syria, you are managing to continue to contribute in such real ways to seeking justice for crimes committed there. Thank you so much again. So this brings us to our discussion about the Central European University, which as most of you know, has faced several recent challenges in the current political environment. Here with us today to talk about CEU, we have Professor Liviu Matai, who is Provost and Pro-Rector of CEU, and a Professor of Higher Education Policy at the School of Public Policy. Professor Matai has taught at universities in Romania, Hungary, and the US, has consulted extensively on higher education policy for the World Bank, UNESCO, the OSCE, the Council of Europe, the European Commission, and other international organizations, national authorities, and universities in Europe and Asia. In conversation with Professor Matai, we have Professor Lisa Anderson, who is an American political scientist and Dean Emerita of Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs of Columbia University. A specialist on Middle Eastern and North African politics, Professor Anderson served as the president of the American University in Cairo from 2011 to 2016, and as provost from 2008 to 2010. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Council on Foreign Relations, and of course, a board member of Scholars at Risk. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speakers to the stage. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure and honor to be with you, and I'd particularly like to thank Dr. Annan for that wonderful endorsement of the work that we're all trying to do. I agree there are many more of you, and I wish we could have all of them with us. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit in this conversation. We talk a lot about individual scholars at risk, but obviously there are institutions under duress. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the institutional context um, for scholarship and what kinds of circumstances are propitious for scholarship and what are not. And obviously, as we all know, that's also a range, a spectrum, if you will. You have circumstances where higher education has collapsed completely, that's Libya, um, where there's, an in, or Syria in many respects, um, where there's a kind of extra legal crackdown on the university sector, which I think Egypt would qualify as at this point. And then you have this rule by law, not rule of law, but this effort to put pressure, to put duress on an institution through, at least on the face of it, sort of legal means. Tell us the situation right now. How is CEU? What is the circumstances? What's the prospects? Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you to the organizers for the, for the invitation. I Just in a few words, I should say I am very grateful for the invitation, but also for the support that these three organizations have uh, brought to us during these this, uh, difficult times, all three of them, as a matter of fact. And I was thinking while, while listening to uh, Lisa's introduction that this is a discussion about an institution rather than about uh, individual scholars. You have probably seen in the program we are the only institution that is discussed in any particular session, and that is not because we are the best higher education institution in the world or the most important, even we at CU don't believe that, but it is certainly because uh, this situation is relevant for what happens in Hungary, what happens in Europe, and probably more generally in the world of, of higher education uh, globally. Uh, we were discussing this morning uh, that sometimes universities, higher education institutions, what happens in higher education helps to reveal more serious issues in the society. And uh, many of you in the room 
are like me, old enough to remember there was a time when we didn't have digital cameras and smartphones to take pictures, so we used those uh, analog machines with the film inside and you couldn't see what is there. You had to put the film and the paper in a substance to reveal the picture. I think in English that substance was called the revelator. So, you know, higher education institutions sometimes serve the function of a revelator or of, uh, you know, very serious uh, and not good things that, that happen in the societies uh, around them. And CEU is such a case. And I believe that is why we are, uh, we are here and we are, we, are, uh, we are discussing. Now, just to answer very, very briefly the, the question, uh, our situation hasn't been solved as, as, uh, as yet. I should say, however, one of the lessons that we have learned is that solidarity matters. We wouldn't be there, we wouldn't be in Hungary had it not been for the immense wave of solidarity that uh, have, has been expressed uh, everywhere in the world, in Hungary, in Europe and, and, and elsewhere in the world. So uh, that mattered for us. Perhaps it didn't matter that much for other institutions, for other countries. Think of Turkey, for example, where there was a lot of solidarity as well, but not with the same type of results. And that's a very interesting question. When solidarity works and when doesn't work, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, at present, we are waiting for the Hungarian government to decide whether they sign a bilateral agreement, a treaty, as a matter of fact, with the state of New York which is required under the Hungarian higher education law in order for any international university like us to function. So we are chartered and accredited in the state of New York. This treaty was negotiated, completed already last year. It just waits for a signature. So we fulfill all other conditions under the law except for this one and we don't have a lot of time to wait. We have uh, communicated this to the, to the government just a week ago. We have the first face-to-face -face meeting with the government outside Hungary as it, uh, as it happens at a secure location. Um, and uh, we cannot wait for long because we have to start the recruitment for the next academic year, 2019-2020, and under the current law, we cannot admit students in Hungary after January 2019. And uh, so uh, we have about until the end of June for the gov Hungarian government to sign or not, or else, else is also possible. And then if that, the signature doesn't happen, we will have to move the entire university to another country. So the university will continue, but we will have to move to another country. And that's the, the, the last thing I, I would like to, 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 to uh, say for now. So this was a case of fight for academic freedom, perhaps even more for institutional autonomy. To be, to be honest, I sometimes disagree with my president telling him this is more directly about university autonomy than directly about academic freedom. But it's not only a matter of principle, it's also about human beings. And I told this to the Hungarian government representatives last week, imagine we have to move with our students, employees, academics, staff members, their families, it will be a few thousand people who will be forced to move from one country to another. Majority are not from Hungary. We have 80% of our students are not Hungarian, 60% of our staff is not Hungarian, but they have families alive, their children go to school in Hungary, so they'll have to move to another country in another, to work in another language outside the university, find jobs eventually for uh, spouses, uh, schools for children. So this will be a very traumatic event and it will be the largest forced movement of population out of Hungary since the 56 revolution. To what extent are the challenges that CEU has faced, and I say this as the former president of a comparably international institution, um, AUC actually, and this is a footnote to your story, AUC was almost nationalized by Nasser and similarly had to negotiate a special status. But that's my question. Is, do you have a special status and how does that reflect your relations with the Hungarian academic establishment, Hungarian universities and so forth? 
Uh, we do have a special status which is uh, a little different from, from uh, the one you have been able to negotiate in, uh, in Egypt. We are primarily, legally speaking, an American university, chartered in the state of New York. All our programs are registered, accredited by the New York Board of Regents. We are accredited as an institution by the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, one of the six uh, major uh, regional accrediting agencies in, in the US. So legally, there we are uh, American. In terms of mission, we are primarily Central European because our mission and you know, uh, this mission was put forward by our founders, who are not only George Soros, but Václav Havel, Bronislav Geremek, who was one of the leader, leaders of the Solidarity Movement in Poland, or Miklos Vasarhely, one of the leaders of the 56 revolution in Hungary. And the mission of the university was to study, promote open society and democracy in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. And our, the university is anchored in terms of values in, in, in this region. So we are an American university legally with a central European identity and then with an increasingly international student body. We have students from 110 countries of the world at present, faculty members from 60 countries of the world. So we are unusual. We, we never denied, you know, sometimes I um, start introducing CU by saying every university is unique, we are even more unique. And because we are in Hungary, we have been in Hungary for 25 hours and our roots in many ways are in Hungary, we decided to become a Hungarian university as well. And we, uh, the Hungarian parliament passed a law in 2004 saying CEU is also a Hungarian university and will have to comply with local legislation accreditation rules. And we are also accredited in, in, uh, in uh, Hungary. So it is in a way like a person who has two passports. So it's one person, but you know you have two passports. Sometimes there are difficulties. You know you can get uh, you know, entrance to one other country with one passport, not with the other passport. What do you do if the two countries go at war against each other? We are we are not there, but it is it is an, a little bit of a, of a special uh, situation. This was an arrangement basically in order to make possible a university without a national agenda. CU doesn't have a national agenda. You know, we don't teach Hungarian history, we teach comparative history of Central and Eastern Europe. We don't teach constitutional law of Romania, but international com constitutional, comparative constitutional law. But what is very, one of the very interesting developments and also lessons here, so we are an international university, you know, demographically. But when this new legislation was adopted in Hungary, there was a you know, there was a lot of support coming from ordinary citizens. You might have seen reports about 85,000 people on the street protesting in support of CEU. Most of them with no relationship with CEU. Nobody in the family working at CEU, nobody studied from their family at CEU, but that is because they appreciate international education and there were, you know, uh, posters, free country, free university, free international education. So it is well known that we are yeah, international institution, but that is appreciated and we have seen a lot of solidarity coming from ordinary people and um, also from other Hungarian institutions. One of the most moving expressions of, of solidarity was coming from a small coffee shop owner in the area where CEU is and he started to sell cappuccino and on the top of the cappuccino there was written with that powder that is normally put there, there was the hashtag, I stand with CEU. So he was selling, he still sells this uh, cappuccino. So there are clearly privileges um, in being CEU in Hungary despite the problems. Um, and there are, there's an attention within the country to you that other universities presumably don't enjoy to the same extent. Um, to what extent does that bring responsibilities? Um, does CEU play a particular kind of role in the higher education landscape that has advantages or disadvantages, tensions? Well, I, I wouldn't now talk of privileges. I would talk about a special 
situation and special circumstances. Because we are international, because we are private and privately endowed, we have actually a lot more freedom and in many ways we are better off than the local uh, universities. Funding for public universities in Hungary was cut by 40%, for example, between 2007 and, and 2014. That didn't happen to us. And we do try to work with other universities in Hungary and also outside Hungary, and it's also very interesting, you know, solidarity, collegiality and solidarity is one of our most important values. And twice a year I welcome new employees and I tell them, you know, CEU is a non-hierarchical institution, collegiality is one of the most important values, take advantage, cultivate, defend it, but also collegiality with others and by way of solidarity. I have never imagined that we would be on the receiving end of solidarity, to be honest. So just to give you a few examples, when the uh, higher education law under Milosevic was, uh, was adopted, we offer uh, shelter to many Serbian academics who came to Hungary. When the law was modified in Belarus and PhD students lost their, their possibility to study, we invited many of them in our disciplines to continue at CU. We have currently a large program of support, which is turning from support to cooperation with universities from, from Myanmar. And we do that in, in Hungary as well. Uh, you know, we are very good, for example, at attracting research grants. And we have not only good faculty members, researchers recruited on the international market, but also the excellent administrative support. So we probably have one of the best uh, research support unit in, in, in Europe. 25% of our budget is, uh, consists of competitive grants coming from the European Commission. So it's 25%, it's huge, probably not comparable with any other university. So we work with Hungarian universities, work together to prepare application grants, or do workshops, or you know, sometimes we have conferences, and joint conferences, and we can afford to bring uh, people from anywhere in the world, they cannot, because they don't have the financial, so we do that, we have, so, and there is a lot we are doing together, and almost all Hungarian universities spoke up in our favor when the crisis is uh, started, one after one, most often under the signatures of the rector or the senate of their universities, sometimes uh, it was uh, individuals, and that is quite a lot in Hungary because, you know, uh, autonomy of Hungarian universities is quite severely restricted by law. Hungarian constitution was modified in 2010, basically taking out the principles of university autonomy and academic freedom, but also institutionally, for the case of public universities, the government appoints a kind of commissar, I call it commissar, you know, they are called chancellors, so it's someone who doesn't have to be an academic, is appointed by the government and has veto rights on anything that has financial implications in that university. And obviously everything has financial implications, so the, the rector, the senate, you know, can be uh, overturned, their decisions can be overturned by, so, and in some cases, uh, professors from Hungarian universities were disciplined by these chancellors for speaking up in favor of, of CU, but they did it, and they did it not that much, or perhaps because we have good relations, but it's for the principles. You know, it's academic freedom, university autonomy, and democracy as well. Now that's a, a, an important element of the role of this collaborative solidarity right. and people see the utility of these kinds of institutions. Clearly, the Hungarian university establishment would be very sad to see you move, for example. So yeah. they would be supporting you. It's, it, it is true. There were some recent developments. We had elections in Hungary recently, and the government won, again, a two-third majority. So these are elections. Everybody has to respect the results of the election, but what is interesting, during the electoral campaign, there was no attack from the government against CEU or government-affiliated newspapers. A few days after the elections, they started again. And one uh, expression of attack, which also speaks perhaps for the, more directly for the profile of this conference, uh, a newspaper very closely associated with the government published a list of academics who happened, happened to be almost all from CEU, who have received funding from abroad, from a particular source, therefore they are impure or perhaps traitors. 
there was this list. The prime minister was asked to comment on that list, and he said, it's normal. The journalists are doing their job, and I rely on them to reveal the traitors among ourselves. But a lot of institutions protested, including one very powerful association of uh, right-wing intellectuals, saying, you know, it is completely unacceptable to point fingers at academics, some of them long dead, as a matter of fact. So the journalists didn't even you know, pay attention who, who is still alive, who is not. So and, you know, people are making jokes about these people coming from dead and be becoming once again enemies of the people and, and, the, and the Hungarian government. But there was you know, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, which is a government uh, agency, protested against that. So that, that, that continues uh, and uh, it, it helps. I should also say this is a new situation. Previously, we only had attacks against the institution. Now we are witnessing uh, or perhaps suffering attacks against individuals. And it is listing these people, but also uh, in, the, in the morning of the Easter Sunday, the Hungarian Prime Minister has a radio show. It's not Chavez style, not that long, but he is alone with a, with a journalist. And his subject was against CEU. And all these people who are acting against the country, corrupting the Christian fiber of the nation. And imagine if you are the son or daughter of a Hungarian professor from CU who believes, you know, who is a religious person, and you hear on Easter morning that, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, your mother or, 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 or father is an enemy of the people. So this is a, a, a very you know, new kind of intimidation against academics, against their, against their families. Nobody was arrested in Hungary. Nobody lost their jobs. You know, so there's a difference from other situations that, that we know. But the direction is perhaps that one. I'm about to open the floor for questions or comments, so get yourself ready. But I have one more question myself, and that is, particularly in light of what you just said, are there things that the institutions sponsoring this Congress can do? What, you know, you have scholars at risk, you have the von Humboldt Foundation. You, um, what are the sorts of things that we might anticipate? Unfortunately, as you know, we tend to be reactive. We have to be reactive. Right. But are there things that we should be thinking about? Right. I, I would say two things, and that is a very long discussion. This is something that concerns me and my, my colleagues uh, quite a lot, thinking not only of, about us at CEU, but about others in, in, um, in, in Europe as well. And the first point is that if we are discussing about institutional autonomy, the key to institutional autonomy is in the hand of the state. The state can turn it off, can turn it on. So what follows, if, we want to def if that is true, if we want to defend university autonomy, like freedom of the institution, as opposed to freedom of the individuals, we have to engage with the state. Because there's where the decision is, the, the key is. And I think that is why it worked in the case of CEU, because there was direct engagement with the Hungarian government. The uh, um, European Commission took Hungary to court. No, the, the case is in front of the European Court of Justice. There were letters sent directly to the Minister of Education by his German counterpart, by his French counterpart. There were letters sent by, I don't know, probably hundreds of rectors, presidents, or vice chancellors directly. So there was a lot of pressure and engagement with the state. And the state did make a step back. So we were supposed to be closed about a year ago already. We have been given an extension. And now, although the situation is not good, there are some back channels. It might still work. If it doesn't work, we move. But that's, for us, is, is, not, is not the end. So that's probably why solidarity didn't work in the case of Turkey. And it didn't work, not because there was no solidarity, but because you cannot engage with the state. You know, the European Commission has no leverage. You know, there's a kind of reciprocal potential blackmail. If you play hardball with us, we open the borders, we let all the Syrians who are there come to Europe, and you better treat us uh, nicely. So they didn't have any leverage. And there is more than that, and this applies probably more generally. I think one 
element in the definition of, a, of the university autonomy should be the capacity to negotiate with the government. Because the government have a right to establish higher education strategies, for example, right? Or national strategy, but can, they can tell to some extent to universities what to do. But do universities have the freedom to negotiate this? In Hungary, that is limited. In the UK, that is pretty significant. I will not talk about Germany, but this in, in Turkey, that is, that is absent. So I think in situations where negotiation is not possible, either for local actors or international actors, there's very little one can do other than helping individual individuals. So, you know, we cannot change the, the legislation. I was thinking, and this is it's becoming a little bit an obsession for me, if the name of the Minister of Education in a given country is Mr. Goebbels, there's nothing to negotiate. So this is one thing. The second thing, what we have also discovered, one of the lessons from our case, is that there is no European codification of university autonomy something actually exists, but very little about academic freedom, for example. And whatever legal provisions, conventions, national legislation exists, they tend to be ignored. When Hungary was taken to court by the European Commission, one of the arguments of the Commission was uh, that the Hungarian higher education law goes against European legislation on academic freedom. The Hungarian government said, there is no European legislation on academic freedom. What are you talking about? So I think one solution, and I am strongly advocating for that, is to try to codify, to have some kind of European codification, European reference, both for university autonomy, which exists to a good extent because the European University Association has done a lot of work on that, and, but also with relation, in relation with academic freedom. And that is something that should include reference to rights, human rights, not only reference to efficiency, because the current discussion about university autonomy in Europe is about efficiency. Let's give the universities the freedom to decide how they do what they are told to do. Okay, we're just about out of time. All right. We are just about out of time. Um, I did promise that I'd have at least a question, so I'm going to exercise the prerogative of the chair. If there's anybody who wants to comment or question, um, this is a chance. If not, there's always coffee. There is one hand, two hands. Please, sir, right back there. And then, what? Yes. So we have, uh, uh, the question was, if we move, do we know where we move? And uh, to keep this short, this was also moving for us. We have received a good dozen of offers to move to other countries, other cities, including a ready-made campus. We were told, if you come as a 1st of June, you just turn on the key to the, to the campus and, and, and go in. We have thought a lot about it. We don't want to move. So our strong preferences remain for all kinds of reasons, from values to logistics. We have the nicest library building in Europe, just built it last year, so we don't want to move. If we were to move, we decided that we go to Austria, Vienna, which is the closest of all possibilities to Budapest. It helps us keep our Central European profile. We hope that we will be able to keep something in Budapest anyway, even if we move to Vienna, perhaps come back one day. You know, when people leave their countries, they say they come back. Very rarely they come back, so I'm not very optimistic about that. But it is, it is Vienna. We can continue for another year in Budapest, 18, 19. We can stay in Budapest. So unless something dramatic happens, we will not have to move until uh, fall 2019, and it will be Vienna. Last question, right here. Thank you so much. Use the mic. John. Sorry. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm a little unclear about this business about the signatures you're uh, expecting. I know that my own university, City University of New York, has taken up and is in discussions with you because my understanding was that you had to declare a campus yes. uh, yeah. somewhere else, and we were willing to offer you that in New York. Uh, so I'm not clear yeah, about the campus versus sure. the signatures. 
Thank you very much. So that, that is a very good and important question. The higher education law uh, modified last year in Hungary, which everybody calls CEU, Lex CEU, because it was modified to make our life difficult or impossible, has among the uh, provisions there a requirement for any international university to have educational activities in the country of origin. We, like the American University in Cairo, are accredited in the United States, but didn't have a campus in the United States. We have it. So we have a small uh, joint set of joint programs with Bard College in upstate New York, and we now are very seriously considering to open a kind of independent campus or joint campus in New York City. But that is, that is not done. And that the Hungarian authorities acknowledge that condition is fulfilled. Now, the other, another provision of the law mentions very specifically the need for an agreement with, between governments, the Hungarian government and the federal government of the United States, specifically about the small CEU, if we want to continue. That is constitutionally impossible under the US Constitution. The federal government would never sign such, cannot sign such an agreement. The Hungarian government agreed to sign an agreement with the state of New York. I should call it a treaty. Actually, this has the value of a treaty under the international law, and it's this treaty that has been negotiated but not signed. Yeah, sorry to pursue this. Is it the governor of New York? Is it the attorney general of New York? It is the government of New York, and the, gov the governor of New York has indicated yesterday for the, the most recently in a letter to the Hungarian government, his willingness to sign the agreement that they have fully negotiated every letter of that, the Hungarian government is thinking about it. So Governor Cuomo is running for election, so we should make sure that he knows that we're not gonna vote for him unless that's, this goes through. That's solidarity, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lisa.